So uh, good morning, everyone. For anyone that doesn't know me, I'm Vivi. I'm the founder of Black Bullion. Hopefully you all know who we are. So I'm not going to give you, not going to give you a spiel about that. Um, really excited to be doing a five part um, student dangers uh, uh, seminar series. Um, really excited that we've managed to get a CPD uh, signed off. So there'll be more details in the next newsletter. So if you attend four of the five, at least four of the five sessions, um, there'll be CPD points attached. Um, so there'll be details in the next newsletter. Keep your eyes out. And if you're not signed up, then, uh, then please do sign up. And the tag team, it's inside the chat system. But I want to kick off because we've got a super special guest and we're really, really excited that Alice um, was willing to join us um, and is and is going to join us today for a for a Q and a about buy now pay later. So uh, quick introduction, um, Alice created Go Fund Yourself um, almost three years ago, which is now a community of over 45,000 people. So we love that. Um, she's also written a book and she does a weekly um, column with Glamour magazine. Um, Alice really is a financial campaigner at her heart. Um, she's trying to uh, bring more spotlight and attention and regulation to the buy now, pay later world, which is absolutely, um, absolutely exploding. Um, the FCA has now brought uh, buy now, pay later products under their remit, and she does BBC Morning Live finance experts. So she's the all round fabulous human when it comes to everything to do with buy now, pay later which we know is causing a lot of confusion in general across the education sector because it is such a popular product that students use. So with no further ado, absolutely delighted to have Alice with us. Um, Alice, if you want to un unmute yourself um, and good morning and welcome to you. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thank you for having me and for that very gloating intro. I'm, I'm very humble. Thank you. We um, humble yeah, about our people. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, so we've got we've got a lot of questions, but I thought what we'd really start with is what on earth is buy now pay later really at its kind of core. What kind of products are out there? What kind of names would people be seeing on student bank statements and the like? So do you want to give us like a picture of the universe, and then we'll go from there? Yeah, absolutely. So buy now pay later broadly. I mean, the term's been around for for years actually. The the concept of buying your stuff now and then deferring payment. We've seen it with sort of store cards and, and stuff like that. But now the terms really evolved. And I think what we're talking about today is a, is a new type of buy now, pay later that in the UK has probably been in existence for the last sort of five years. Um, and, and what we're really talking about is a type of financial service that's integrated into online shopping or e-commerce. Um, the main players are Klarna, Clearpay and Layby. You've probably seen them on kind of buses or, or on the tube in magazines. Um, and really, as I say, they're integrated into the online shopping experience. So let's just sort of give you an example of how that would work. You're going on holiday, you want to buy a couple of new dresses um, and, a, and a bikini. And instead of paying with a debit card, um, let's say on, on ASOS, um, you see something that says Klarna, either pay later um, in 30 days or split into three and does what it says on the tin, rather than paying for it now, you pay for it either in 30 days or split it into three. Now, just to kind of add a layer of confusion into this very complex world, um, th there are sort of two camps when it comes to buy now, pay later. There's the no interest charging products, which generally are unregulated. And that has been my focus. It's by far the biggest part of the, the buy now, pay later market. They're the ones that you see advertised and pushed by influencers a lot on social media. Um, they're the ones that are available on all the fast fashion sites. But there is also the interest charging products. To speak in Klarna language, this is called Klarna's financing product. Now these are regulated, but generally they're available on pricier items. So wedding dresses, expensive watches, that kind of thing. But what we're mainly talking about today is that no interest unregulated product, which is will be the one that students are using the most. And students have been like specifically targeted by a lot of these a lot of these groups. And when we've asked students about whether they use these kind of products, often they say to us, you know, they're not they're not bad. They're actually really helpful. And I wonder if you feel like there might be some confusion about whether they are absolute bad or absolute good or do they sit kind of in the middle? Yeah, it's a, it's a really challenging one because there's been a lot of kind of moralization I think around these products and actually just debt in general which I think is something to be really mindful of but to not kind of debt shame people um 
However, no, I don't think they're either sort of inherently bad or inherently good as with any kind of financial product. It's really how you use them as to whether they are right or, or good or bad for you. I think um, what my focus has been and what I've been most concerned by is the way that the products are actually marketed. Um, particularly last year when I launched the campaign in June, there was a lot of really bad practice going on and particularly in the student or uh, you know people with fluctuating incomes um you would see adverts like why wait till payday or um no money no problems just use buy now pay later now in in my mind that's just unethical and irresponsible um so that's been the concern for me it's it's about how the products have been advertised also affordability which we can get onto um but no i don't think it's the case that they are all bad and they can actually be really useful for people you could argue given that there many of them charge no interest that that is a much better route than you know accruing high you know 29% apr um credit card debt for example but it's a it's new it's not necessarily better or worse it's just different do you think it is a gateway to kind of worse practices with credit and debt usage so i think there's a couple of things there my concern has been that um you know, if you take Klarna, for example, a lot of the time in, in their responses, they'll, you know, they'll say, oh, but it, but it's no interest. But you have to remember that they do have a financing product on higher value items where they charge about 19% um, APR. So I, I think there's, there is a risk, certainly, that it's seen as this sort of totally innocent option, which also lets, it, it's not, it's not risk-free, which we can talk about. Um, but, but, you know, it's pushed as this kind of new, no interest, why pay interest option, when actually, you know, it, there, there is sort of an argument to suggest that perhaps they're then going to push you into the interest charging products. I mean, also with younger people as well, it's now probably their first interaction with credit. Um, so when you combine that with the way that these products are being talked about on social media and the language, because they're unregulated, they can get away with this kind of langu language of, um, you know, totally risk-free, don't wait till payday. I think that's where the risk where the risk really really lies yeah i would i would completely agree with that i'm reminded that we we discussed last week the i think it was Klarna who was saying you know it's great for your mental health because during lockdown you can easily buy things that make you feel good and our community of which you know a lot of people on this call kind of belong um are really focused on on young people's mental health do you have any kind of thoughts about you know how how these are impacting on on short term and longer term mental health of, of young people fundamentally it's it's wrong and really dangerous i think to suggest that um you know shopping can be a remedy to to emotional or mental health challenges um i think anecdotally i don't know whether there is any any sort of quantifiable evidence of the impact on mental health but certainly anecdotally and the case studies that have come forward to me there's often, there often is a correlation between those that might be struggling um, with their mental health and also struggling to keep on top of payments. There's actually the, the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute is a really is a really good one for this. And I think it's, you know, one in four, um, one in four people in debt have a mental health problem. And there's that inextricable link that you can't really, you know, you can't really argue about, to be honest with you. Um, so definitely, I think it's something for mental health teams to be aware of around money problems more broadly, but particularly for young people today, being mindful that this might be an avenue that um, is kind of exploding in popularity um, and certainly something to be aware of. Yeah, absolutely. And for anyone that hasn't seen it, we did a money mental health report a couple of months ago and found much the same thing. The, the topics are completely interrelated. If you're struggling with your mental health, chances are it's impacting on your money. And if you're struggling with your money, chances are it's impacting on your mental health. And, and we know, you know, we know anecdotally, as, as Ala said, we know that to be true. Um, but the data is starting to is starting to come out. Um, Alice, I wonder how you feel in terms of uh, the fact that students are using, and as you said, we don't want to be moralizing to people and, and, and students are adults and, and they should be doing, you know, doing what, what suits them. Um, but I wonder whether buy now, pay later is opening up this gateway to there are things that I can't afford and therefore this is an avenue for doing it and how we might in, use that as a part of the overall debt conversation without moralizing. And I wonder if you have, I know it's something our community struggle with is, how to help people to keep their debt low while also not telling them that they shouldn't be spending and how that how that messaging can be done yeah it's certainly it's a really 
challenging one, isn't it? Because to sort of argue and say, oh, you should be using buy now, pay later on these products, but not on fast fashion. And I think it's it's a really challenging one. I think for me, the language, it comes down to a, a few things. I think the, the conversation is really around, you know, why you might want to use them. And is it a question of, are you sort of just postponing the pain of paying no one really likes paying for things I think there's there's really interesting psychological studies where they've put you know stickers on your brain and it shows that there's almost physical pain in actually paying for stuff and you know it's something that we're all guilty of doing we don't want to do that and if there's an option there that means oh great you know I don't need to I don't need to worry about this this month um, and I'll sort of you know push it down the line then I think it's having that conversation to say is it is it the question that you're just wanting to postpone that um, or is it um, something that you sort of feel that you're responsible enough to manage yourself and actually it's a question of you know you really need this thing um, you, you, you need to find a way to pay for it somehow and buy now pay later is a really great way of kind of smoothing out that cost um, I think also it's about understanding and information that if if we're equipped with the information and you're equipping students with the information to make an informed decision um, and and that's something that they you know feel they have all the information to do then then fantastic I think the worry and the thing to be aware of is that often the buy now pay later providers themselves aren't great at actually putting that information out there so I think that's where it's fantastic if student services and, and so on are able to provide that information in a non-judgmental way that provides a kind of a bit of a checklist maybe to say okay um you know can you afford it is this something that you know um do you understand the product that you're using and so on um i think that's the key really it comes down to it comes down to kind of understanding and, and education which is obviously um why we're here today and what you guys are doing yeah, absolutely. I, I find so I was using um, I occasionally use PayPal split payments mm. um, for for more expensive um, items. And something that I've noticed is that when it then comes up on your bank statement, it doesn't say like payment one of three or mm. two of three. And actually, I think if we could have if we could almost have that in there, so you know how many more are to come, you can budget it more easily. But, um, you know, you're making a choice. Mm. But within two or three months, you've probably forgotten that you bought that thing that was 80 pounds that suddenly is yeah. going to cost you 30 pounds this month. Um, and so I wonder if for student, you know, for, for staff in terms of supporting students, when, when you are going through bank statements, looking at, you know, how far that student is into that payment cycle and are they at the beginning or are they at the end, just trying to get a grip. Um, we've been running the money confessions um, marketing campaign with students where they post their confessions and something that's come up a bunch of times is just keeping track of all of the different ones. So people have Klarna and they have PayPal and they have Afterpay and suddenly you've got 50 payments in the month. Um, any, any way that, is there any kind of tech that people can use to track that? Is there any um, mechanism other than trying to remember that you yeah. can think of that might help the guys on the call? Yeah, actually, and you just sort of reminded me, there's a, there's a third question. So on that kind of, can you afford it? Uh, yeah, I, I'd say there's, just to kind of recap on that, actually, there I'd say there are three questions, you know, do you need it can you afford it and can you manage it which is the point there that you're getting at and i think unfortunately that is something that the buy now pay later providers don't make easy plus the fact you've got multiple providers out there who all have a different kind of user experience and there's unfortunately not that i'm aware of a way of seeing all of that in one place i mean there are open banking money apps that allow you to sort of see subscriptions in one place um, a couple that come to mind uh, um, there's one called emma uh, clio is another one now i don't think as far as i'm aware that you can actually see all of your klarna payments in one place yet that would be fantastic if you could but what i would probably encourage students to do is i mean just use old-fashioned you know pen and paper and just to at least have a list of your upcoming payments and a list of the buy now pay later products that you have got and that you're managing um, and most importantly to make a note of your payment dates generally certainly with with the likes of Klarna they do they do make it relatively clear as to when your payments are coming up if you have the app I think so just 
being aware of when those payments are due, putting it in your calendar, for example, is in setting reminders. It's a bit old school, isn't it? I feel like we should have some kind of really, really sort of high tech solution to this. But I think unfortunately, and this goes across the board with lenders, they're not necessarily incentivized to give you the best, best kind of experience for actually making payments. Um, so yeah, I, I would say kind of the old fashioned route of, of making making a note and kind of keeping on top of things is, is the best best way of going about it at the moment. Yeah, grandma's way of budgeting is yeah. still from the best. You need Bit to of Excel. One, of these, <laughs> one of these low tech thingies. Uh, and yeah, so exactly. we are we are working on some stuff at, at Black Bullion to try and streamline some of this, but it is um, the, the innovation that is going into a lot of these debt products. Mm -hmm. um, it is exciting for young people and suddenly you can afford to buy things that you couldn't before. And there, there has been this negative relationship with credit cards, um, which was kind of good, but has now been kind of taken over by, by some of this, which is dangerous because it's slick and it's sexy and it's fun and it's, you know, pink. Um, and that that can be a you know that can be a real a real challenge. So thinking in terms of staff, and just to reiterate, guys, if you've got any questions, um, although we are recording, we'll cut out the the individuals so that everyone feels like it's a safe space to ask questions. So if you have questions for Alice, it is a unique opportunity to ask her. So please don't be uh don't be embarrassed to ask any questions um to pose for her. Um, what can staff look for when when speaking with a student? You've mentioned the kind of the three critical questions, um, and and how we might be able to track things in bank statements um, and the like, how can staff introduce those conversations without seeming to be patronizing, um, which is something that we know we, everybody struggles with and we've heard from multiple people. Um, any, any thoughts from a language point of view or, or anecdotally anything that you've heard um, in terms of what a successful conversation about this might look like or an honest conversation might look like? Yeah, that's a, it's a really interesting one. And I think, again, it comes back to not being judgmental and genuinely I mean the information that, that I'm giving you is, is true that these products are not all bad I don't want you to go away kind of thinking that we have to you know that it, it's a conversation for example that you might have with students around kind of um sexual health for example where you know it's it's a it's a very difficult one around, I don't know, slightly strange to be talking about, but you know, STIs, for example, where it's, we know that that's not a good thing and we want to encourage students away from that. That is not the case with, with buy now, pay later. And they are not all bad. And there are, there's some students out there that, for example, are, I don't know, they need to buy a new, um, a desk for their room or something like that. Then this could be a fantastic way of doing that. And so I think it's about not being judgmental and starting the conversation around, um, ah, that's, you know, that's interesting you're using those, um, you know, even sort of maybe having a conversation of, you know, they're kind of exploding in popularity, aren't they? I have no idea about, you know, about these products. How, how have you come across them? How are you managing them? And, and maybe introducing the conversation that way to kind of, um, to, to sort of nudge students towards resources um, that maybe give them the information they need to kind of understand the risks of using them because I think that's which we'll, we'll probably get onto is that it, it differs across all of the products the risks of using them whether they damage your credit score and all of that stuff is it, it just varies hugely so I think maybe just a gentle warning is just so you know I know that that Klarna product might not damage your credit score but just be aware that some of them do so it's just worth being really mindful of how the products differ but that being said they can be fantastic and you know absolutely not saying that you shouldn't shouldn't um kind of go near them but it's just worth being mindful that they can they can differ from product to product I think it's that kind of conversation um that's worth having and also um, yeah, and, and also those kind of points that we said around just a helpful tip for managing them. A lot of people are finding that they lose track with payments, as you said. So just having that conversation around general tips to kind of manage them a bit better um, and, and be more be more kind of mindful, I guess, and, and staying on top of it and staying on top of payments. So let's let's talk about the dangers. We've spoken kind of about the benefits, um, and probably a lot of people on the call have done split payments at some at some point. Um, let's talk about the dangers in terms of things like credit credit cards and and uh, credit scoring, sorry, and and the like. How do you see the differences and the advantages of perhaps one product over another? If we can use advantages, in yeah, the absolutely. So, um, so as I say, they they all differ. I'd say around risk, nearly all of them. If you 
do not make a payment and you consistently fail to to kind of make that payment eventually you will end up in the hands of a debt collection agency now this isn't necessarily a bailiff knocking on your door um they're sort of much more digital these days but nonetheless there is that that sort of final threat of a debt collection agency what happens before then um differs so some of them charge late payment fees clear to my knowledge clear pay and um lay by which are two of the most popular they both will charge late payment fees um which is worth being mindful of because although the late payment fees are capped if you actually do the sums it can work out to actually be quite a high percentage of the cost of the item even though it's not technically an interest rate obviously but if you if you kind of do the maths it can be quite high um 24 sort of 24 pounds i think um for for clear pay um so late payment fees that's one Klarna do not charge late payment fees um but as i say to my knowledge clear pay and lay by do around credit score damage this is a really interesting one actually because on the surface you might think great some of them don't damage your credit score um Klarna and uh clear pay for example um it, it's a bit murky as to whether they ever have but now currently what they would say is that they're um, unregulated 0% interest product will not damage your credit score. They have the ability to, but they won't report to a credit reference agency. Um, it, this is, by the way, just putting aside the financing products that charge interest rates because they they obviously will damage your credit score. We're just talking about the the one you know the ones that are available on the fast fashion sites um, that we mentioned mentioned earlier. Now the the challenge around credit scores is that. There's an argument to say, and actually lay by, which is one of the buy now pay later providers um, that are trying to position their, themselves as more responsible. There is an argument to say, actually, it's a good thing that they report to credit reference agencies because it means if they report to a credit reference agency, that information of a late payment is then available for other lenders to then make a better decision about whether you should report to that person. And that is one of the big issues and where the regulation is coming in um, is to say, actually, there need to be better affordability checks. Um, however, from the consumer perspective, if you're interested in whether they damage your credit score or not, it's important to go directly to the buy now pay later provider and check with them as to whether it will if you miss a payment. As I say, at the moment, Klarna and ClearPay, I don't think they do. Lay by, they sort of argue that they're being more responsible in reporting to credit reference agencies. But as this kind of illustrates, it's pretty complex. And also they've changed their policies over the years, certainly since the beginning of the campaign to now things have evolved. Um, so the best thing and to, to advise students to do is to um, check it out with the buy now pay later provider or an organization like you know which which provide really useful breakdowns of of the risks and of course as always we will highlight all of the resources that alice mentions um in the in the follow-up um in the follow-up piece other than the um credit scoring and i didn't realize that that every product was behaving slightly differently so the the level of complexity is actually beyond really what it should be um what other dangers apart from obviously that you might overspend and not be able to afford it are there any other dangers that staff should be aware of or that they can have kind of in their arsenal for the conversation with students so i think the main so yes th those three debt collection obviously for all of them i think is really important damage to credit score late payment fee um i'd also just say to be mindful and to to articulate that that's some of the products and that's yes they don't charge interest these ones that we're talking about and the ones that most students will be familiar with no they don't charge interest however Klarna being a good example, they do have a financing product which does charge interest. And certainly what I've seen is that the marketing between the two, it's pretty hard to tell the difference. So I don't think it would be impossible for somebody to um, look at a Klarna financing product and kind of think it was quite similar. And then possibly they're then getting down a road of, you know, actually much higher interest, um, much higher interest products with even greater risks, even, certainly damage to credit score if you don't keep up with your payments. Um, and, and that's kind of a slightly more serious avenue. So I would just maybe say to students um, to be mindful of the differences in the products and also to be aware that there are buy now pay later products which do charge interest. 
Klarna have one, for example, but there are others, you know, other kind of similar store card type products as well. So just to be mindful, mindful of those and that they might have more serious consequences um, of not keeping up with payments. And then the other one is just to be aware. I mean, Klarna used to have this figure that they promoted on their um, business to business site, which said that uh, I think shoppers will have spend 55% more or something something along those lines when using um, buy now pay later. So it's just being mindful that there is that kind of psychological effect of these products that will undoubtedly um, cause you to spend more money than maybe you want to. So just being mindful of that, but ultimately with the preface that, but it's your decision. And um, if that's something you can afford, then fantastic. It is such a difficult conversation, right? When we're trying not to be judgy because we shouldn't be judgy. And, but also knowing that a lot of people just don't understand the consequences of some of these products and, and balancing those two. And it's interesting what you just said about the 55% more. Um, I, I remember we had this conversation as, as a community when contactless, and it's only a few years ago, we forget how fast the technology is evolving. When contactless became the preferred way of spending, that that also showed that people were more likely to spend twice as much money as when they were using cash. And now it's 55% more if you use these things. So if we compared buy now, pay later to contactless and contactless to cash, we're probably spending two or three times more than we would have if we were handing over money. Yeah. Um, and the technology is evolving so very, very quickly without the education keeping, keeping okay. pace. And, and that is, I think, really part of the challenge here. So if a staff member is sitting with a student and they've got a bank statement in front of them, which a lot of a lot of staff members do when they're assessing, you know, hardship or, or when there's, you know, a student needs some help. Is there any indication or hints in that statement as to whether the student is using a, a interest payment or a non interest facility? Is that at all differentiated? Do you um, it it might be the case that it would say um, it might have something like financing on it. Um, so you might see language like financing. And if it says that, then it, it's possibly the case that they're using using kind of an interest charging product. Um, I mean, the things to simply look out for are the names of the buy now, pay later providers. So clear, pay, lay, buy, Klarna, split it, um, it is another one. Also, I guess a sign of, of um, kind of challenge, it, uh, a sort of financial challenge might be seeing those late fees. Um, and I, I, I think in that instance, you would probably see, it, it would probably say it in the, um, in the item on the on the bill but it would probably be a fee of sort of like six pounds or 24 pounds or, or something like that from um clear pay or lay by by being the two that do that so that might be something to just be mindful of if there are late payment fees um i'm just trying to think of anything else i think i think that's that's it really um i, I just wanted to add on just another another thing to be just be mindful of the way these products work as well is that they're also so integrated into social media, which I think is something to be really, really aware of. Not only that influencers are now being paid to talk about buy now, pay later quite a lot, um, but you'll also see, um, let's just use the example of um, Pretty Little Thing, which which kind of use use many of these products. You would see that the, they would be promoting a product as a paid ad or even just sort of organically on social media and be encouraging the use of, say, Klarna or ClearPay um, for that product. And then obviously you can just shop now within social media, within Instagram, for example. Um, and so it's, it's just being aware that that integration and that overlap now between spending money and social is just kind of it's so so integrated and if you want to have a look at just a, a really interesting just go on TikTok and type in sort of Klarna or ClearPay and the results are quite interesting. <laughs> Yeah, you're tapping into something that we have been concerned about for a little while. We've actually got a blog coming out for students specifically about fin influencers and yeah. these influencers who are one day, you know, selling, I don't know, face cream and the next day are selling, you know, cryptocurrency trading. And exactly. there's a real, there's a real and growing concern, not just I think for for staff and for support people, but actually for students themselves, because being able to differentiate between true advisors and guidance okay. and 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 that and people who are simply getting paid a cut uh, on their TikTok for yeah. promoting pretty little things um i feel for students i feel like they are really tackling quite yeah. a difficult um quite a difficult landscape um a couple of questions um alice um one it's coming can spending via coke 
a coping, sorry, can spending be a coping mechanism if someone who is struggling with their mental health, um, there are clear signs when somebody is struggling with their mental health. Um, so we touched a little bit on the mental health um, and spending. Um, any, any kind of thoughts um, on that? Yeah. I mean, if I'm anything to go by, and I think lots of people feel this, is that, you know, if you're feeling a bit down, particularly, I, you know, Sunday evening, lots of us end up looking online at, you know, reasons to spend money. Um, that's just, I think that's just a very, like, common human experience. And yes, if, if in tandem with that, you're being kind of pushed um by now, pay later, and, and, you know, not having to, not having to pay for stuff now, and you're, uncertain about your finances and you're being told don't worry about don't wait till payday or whatever it might be then certainly I think it can be a, a very easy coping mechanism and a kind of go-to um yeah so I, I think that's something to be really really mindful of particularly for mental health teams in in having um you know I guess often we talk about around mental health the go-to will be like you know how are relationships or how are um, other sort of um triggers i suppose that might that might cause someone to to experience mental health challenges but absolutely i think a, a, an obvious one is to think about you know where how are finances um kind of interacting uh with your mental health and is that something that you might want to have a conversation about i think certainly that's a really really great point yeah do you think covid has had an impact on that like you mentioned sunday night right we're not sunday night at the pub with friends now we're kind of sitting in front of the television kind of scrolling yeah. down the instagram hole um is there any evidence or any anecdotal evidence that you've heard around covid's impact on on the use of these products yeah i mean it's been extraordinary um the, I, I, I'm sort of quoting the figures off the top of my head, but if you look at Klarna's monthly active users uh, from the start of the pandemic to say Christmas last year, it's it's pretty much a three or four fold increase. It's it's exploded largely thanks to the pandemic. Um, and yes, that's that's online shopping, so much time being spent on social media. It's given these providers a fantastic opportunity to kind of push their brand. Um, so yeah, unquestionably that's had an impact. And then also you think about the uncertain financial environment that many people are in, the idea of having something that, you know, you don't need to pay for it just yet, or you can smooth out your payments over a few months is a really, really attractive option for people. So definitely. Yeah, the, uh, the financial hits from COVID are going to keep on coming. I don't think we've even begun to see the beginning of the of the financial crisis that'll that'll come yeah. off the health crisis, unfortunately. Um, so so we've got a question around uh, good debt, which is which is something that we, we talk about an awful lot. So how can we guide students around the misconception of good debt? I've attended um, multiple student sessions with banks who advoc advocate to students to take on good debt. Um, so that they can build up a credit score to qualify for home loans down the lines, but students don't really seem to understand negative implications if they can't make payments on time. Mm. Uh, the sessions seem really unethical to me. I don't, uh, I don't disagree with that analysis. Any, any thoughts um, about the good debt, bad debt yeah. uh, elements of this? I mean, it speaks to just a massive bugbear of mine and more of a, um, a kind of structural problem, really, which is the fact that we've got this really archaic system of you need debt to get debt and it's 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 kind of messed up but um I think of course yeah I, I think it's about having a conversation with students about obviously banks are this is how banks make money and this is how you know this is this is the kind of products that they'll they want you to take on um how do you where do you go for kind of unbiased advice and 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 you're right there is this kind of narrative that's just been so you know we all believe now that oh having a credit card is a really good thing you must have a credit card you know as long as you use it well that's fine and and actually for some people it can be a terrible mistake getting a credit card because they're not ready for it they don't understand it um and they end up you know in in with financial problems and problem debt um i think a a kind of language that i quite like around thinking about debt is um is obviously it's a question of sort of what is the what is the item and for me if it's something that's going to appreciate in value um, or it's an investment or it's something that you absolutely need um, so just to kind of illustrate what that might look like you know obviously going to university I'd say that's a really good investment and arguably something that kind of appreciates or increases your potential to earn money so um, you know that's that can be a good reason needing a car to get to work obviously that's sort of an essential 
Um, but yeah, that, that language around, is it something that you need or is it going to appreciate or is it an investment in your future? Then yeah, I think that's that's a really good, good argument to look at maybe credit products. Um, I think the unfortunate thing is that the way that debt has been kind of pushed and also buy now pay later, it kind of is creating this narrative that saving is for boring people and it's sort of outdated now and old fashioned. And unfortunately, you know, you can't, you can't Klarna or buy now or, or, you know, clear pay a house deposit, you know, ultimately you have that involves putting money aside. And I think there's just a risk that uh, we, we kind of don't focus enough on the habits of actually just putting putting money aside every month um and and that can feel like a, even saying it you know it feels like quite an old-fashioned thing to be saying but ultimately you know that's that's the only way really of um of of kind of building building a financial future and stability and so on so um yeah it's it's a challenging challenging one but i think i would start with that conversation around appreciating um assets and also needs and necessities yeah absolutely and we do uh, many of you will know we do fortnightly student webinars and the question of debt comes up all the time and one of the things we say to students if they really are keen to get a credit card and build their credit score because and i agree with you alice i think it's absurd that you need to get into debt to prove that you can manage debt i think it's just a ridiculous situation what we suggest to students who want to do it is to get a credit card set up your direct debit for your electricity bill and then cut up the card um, so that you don't actually physically have the card but you and you have an automatic payment that's set up a standing order to pay it off every single month and then you can build your credit without actually having a credit card when i first moved to the uk my credit card had a 200 pound limit and and that's fantastic because you can't it's very difficult to overspend like that um, but today you can't get less than a thousand and this is you know so the whole system is set up to drive people into debt that is how the entire system is set up um, and it is it is a difficult one, but I echo your uh, your good debt, bad debt. So there's a question um, submitted specifically about your activities, which are, you know, on behalf of the entire country, we thank you for the hard work that you were doing around regulations. Um, but the question is, did Alice face any objections to the regulate buy now pay later campaign from users rather than the companies themselves, which is interesting. Um, thinking that if you did this could align with student beliefs that actually buy now pay later isn't actually risky. Um, did you have any users or, or young people against mm -hmm. the campaign? Fascinating yeah. question. The, the, I, I guess the main, I mean, certainly the main backlash was was from the providers themselves. Um, there was a, occasionally, I'd say it was the minority of interactions with the campaign, but there were there were certainly a few messages I received it, to be honest with you, though, it would either be around they'd sort of mistaken the campaign that I'd got personally got into a lot of buy now pay later debt, and now I was sort of just saying I was just angry, um, and so they was just saying you know you people should take personal responsibility and that line, um, you know, Daily Mail kind of commenters that 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 sort of tone. Um, or it was, um, but there were a couple. I mean, it was it wasn't many actually who would say, "I love Klarna, I love I love Clearpay," um, and and you know, you're you're. They sort of think that I was trying to ban the products or something, and that I was trying to you know take them all down, and um, and they were angry at that. But by and large, and I hope this was because I'd, we'd sort of very carefully communicated the campaign's objectives that pretty much in everything I said it was this is not saying that buy now pay later is all bad they can be useful and used well by many people so it, everything was really prefaced with that uh, and 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 the emphasis of the campaign was not necessarily on the majority of buy now pay later users it was actually on the minority of people who had Oh, actually use them accidentally because they were for a time the default payment option which is a whole nother story um, or people that had you know mental health challenges and had racked up significant amounts of debt or they you know 19 year olds with no idea really about what these products were and there was no information about risk at checkout and stuff like that um, so with all of that in mind I think most people understood that the objective was really around education and certainly not saying that these can't be useful and, and used well and um so yeah I, th I think it's maybe a couple but by and large it was quite well understood i think yeah the the personal responsibility is obviously something we all believe in but it's very difficult for people to take personal responsibility over something that has been made deliberately complex and deliberately misleading and that's part of of course why we do what we do and why you do what you do if we can educate people then they can be 
empowered yeah. to then take personal responsibility but this stuff is not intuitive and it's okay designed to remove that moment of thought it's it's that it's the it's the lollies at the checkout counter right the whole point is that it's impulsive um and i've always said if we can just get students to take five minutes between wanting something and doing something about it then actually we could resolve 50 yeah. percent of the problems because it's that impulse that's that's kind of the issue um but really good on you for what you're good on you i'm leaning into my aussieism but really good on you for, for the work that you're doing i think it is really genuinely so so very important um how do you feel and it's just a last question kind of from me because we were talking about um sort of young people and 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 the debt um issue and i wonder how much we I met up with some of the staff yesterday and somebody was saying that their their youngest sibling was saying, you know, they're never going to be able to afford a home. They're never going to be able to do all of these kind of traditional life milestones that we expect. And so, of course, they're spending more money on, you know, fast fashion and things like that because they don't feel like the big purchases, the good debt will ever actually come to fruition. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about whether it's it's a bit of a cat and mouse issue or, or whether it is a psychological issue. I don't know if you've got any thoughts yeah. on that. Yeah, and it's it it kind of can can actually be a bit of a kind of um, philosophical question, really, of what people want in life. And I and I actually kind of admire people in a way that are saying, you know what, screw this, I'm never going to be able to afford a house. And and for many people, that is actually true. You know, I don't think it's right to just tell people, oh no, there's help to buy. You know, still that's not going to be affordable for many people, and there are many people that will not be able to afford a home. Um, the question then comes as to how whole different question of that, how do you reform rental stuff and make that better for people, um, which which is a big issue. But um, you know, so I think that's actually a really fair point that many people won't be able to um to to afford a house and many will therefore take the view that actually you know I want to enjoy life now and um that's that's my life choice and people should be entirely entitled to do that we're obsessed with home ownership in the uk and i don't think it's good to just push that down people's throats to say that's the only option um but with that uh which is a sort of slightly depressing depressing angle i think it again it comes back to giving people the information they need um and realistic information you know to to say what might be possible for them and yes not to entirely believe you'll never ever be able to buy a house lot many many will as well um particularly those that go on to you know higher earning jobs for example um that that it, it might be possible but i think it comes back to providing um accurate and realistic information so that people can make decisions about what's best for them and that should have every option on the table it shouldn't just be saying buy now pay later is all bad and home ownership is fantastic i think it has to be nuanced and it has to enable people to make the decisions for themselves absolutely hence education yeah. uh so ruth has an operational question which i now feel i should have asked right at the beginning so my apologies no, no, ruth. ruth asking for the products that are interest free where are the companies actually making their money really good question yeah an important question so aside from any late fees uh that the companies might um might get from people missing payments which for some of them i believe can actually is is a fairly high percentage of their revenue um but for the likes of Klarna, as i say they don't charge late payment fees so it's not that um their business model is on the e-commerce retail retail sites so they are charging the likes of asos pretty little thing with uh, yeah, a small percentage cut of every purchase. Hence, as you can imagine, they are hugely, hugely valuable companies making an enormous amount of money. Um, and that's a really good point and why I would why I say that actually in some ways they could be better than a, a credit card if you really need the debt or need the credit because you're not going, you know, they're not making the money on you necessarily, unless you are late paying, they're making the money from the e-commerce sites. Um, so yeah, it's it's kind of turned around the, the entire credit market. Yeah, and these are some of the most valuable uh, companies in Europe. Um, Klarna in particular is a multi-billion pound euro dollar um, organization. Uh, and that's why Alice's work is so very critical because they have for the most part been pretty under the radar in how they do things and yet are multi-billion dollar uh, companies and should should answer the same way as any other um, as any other fintech question. 
Um, so Paul, I'm asking if there is um, resources to send students. Paul, we're putting some some stuff together, so uh, just keep an eye um, keep an eye on that. But we are we are putting together some specific resources around around educating students um, about this. Um, is there a minimum age to use these interest free products? Um, 18, yeah, so it should should still be 18, although there have definitely been a couple of articles about, you know, people that have managed to 14 year olds that have managed to manage to use them, um, you know, because because they're so um, easily accessible, there's very little information you need to input there's no sign up form either you know you just you just put in an email address um so there have been cases of younger people managing to use them but strictly speaking it's it's over 18. again 10 points for social media doing its job to help people <laughs> into good habits uh so alice um one uh one very last question if there was a top and thank you so much for that it was really helpful um one top tip uh for students who are thinking about buy now pay later you've given us the three questions that people should ask themselves what's kind of a top tip that you would that you would have if a student came to any of these fabulous people that we work with and said i'm thinking about using this what do you think um i think the first the first one is sorry not to say first i'm going to give you two um <laughs> it's cheating Go for it. Go um, for it. i i'd say a good question to ask is uh, is around affordability and whether someone has some kind of budget in place. I mean, let's be honest, I'm sure the vast majority of students don't have an Excel spreadsheet where they're tracking all their inco income is, and I don't do that either, so I wouldn't expect them to. But I think um, at least asking, do you have some idea of where that money is coming from? In Is that a budget or whatever that might look like? Just, just a question around affordability. And then another question around um, managing it. And that's when I'd say, get that little list. So you've you know, got the payment dates in your calendar um, and, uh, and have made a note of all the different buy now, pay later um, products that you're currently using. And once you've made the payment, then you know, strike it off and, uh, and kind of keep it going on an, on an ongoing basis so that you can really keep track. Um, I wish there was a kind of handier solution, but I think realistically at the moment, that's the best, that's the best approach. Yeah, I, I agree. I wish people only use buy now, pay later the way we always have, which is for big ticket items like your furniture, because then it's hundreds of pounds a month and you can't really lose that. The problem is when it's a 20 pound dress here and it's 40 pounds of face care there and it's a 50, you know, 500 pound bike, that's when things tend to get really lost in the system and suddenly there's 500 pounds a month that you owe on, on you know, on 30 different products. Yeah. Um, Alice, if there are no last uh, questions that people quickly sneak in, I just want to thank you so much. That was really, really helpful and hopefully informative um, for everyone who's who's joined us. I know it is a growing issue and we're only going to see more of it. These companies aren't going anywhere. If anything, there are many, many more of them coming up the uh, coming up through the ranks. And it's all down to the marketing that they're putting in and the influencers, as, as Alice said. So um, so hopefully we will have more information around it and Alice will continue to do her fantastic work and get them actually regulated, um, but they are not going away. Um, so something just to, to really bear in mind. Um...